Uh, I want to first welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our how-to training for telepractice and early intervention. My name is Molly Wallace and my colleague Brooke Lambert and I are so excited to be here with you today to provide a training on how to provide early intervention services using telepractice. A couple of weeks ago, uh, when me and the owner of the company where I work, Marlena Sanchez at Pronto Therapy Group, when we realized that in-home services were gonna be suspended for an unknown amount of time, we quickly put together a training to unknown help participant is now joining. be more comfortable with the idea of using coaching interaction and clinical skills in a new service delivery model. Over the last couple of weeks, my colleague Brooke Lambert and I have been able to improve and condense it for today's purposes. We really hope that today's training provides you with the confidence and the competence to continue serving and supporting your families. Um, I said this, I said this earlier, but during this trainings, we are going to show different videos. And I encourage each of you to do some self-reflection and jot down observations and questions um, that you have while, while you watch. And um, if you're participating in by watching the recording, you can pause and go ahead and have some group discussions with the people that you are uh, taking this training with. So I'm gonna go ahead and toss it over to Brooke and she's gonna start by giving you a little bit of our background information. Thank you, Molly. Um, just like Molly said, we are so happy to be here. I'll start off by providing you with background information as to why we are the ones here presenting today and how this came to be. So in 2012, we took a certification course at Waldo County General Hospital in Maine, and we were certified by the American Telemedicine Association for telepractice. And since then, we've still been providing those telepractice services since 2012. We also presented at ASHA in 2012 and Shining Stars in 2013. And many, many of the slides today that you'll see have information that was pulled from those presentations. Molly is a speech pathologist and clinical supervisor at Pronto Therapy Group with 12 years experience in early intervention services in Northern Virginia, mostly in Fairfax County and Alexandria City. And myself, I'm also a speech pathologist uh, at First Words, Inc., with 10 years experience as an early intervention provider in Fairfax County, and now I'm in Albemarle County. So again, we are so happy to be here to teach you more about the best practice of this teletherapy. And, and so here's our disclosure statements for, uh, for myself and for Brooke, and you can read those on your own. Um, so we're going to read these, I'm not going to take much time today reviewing all of these position statements um, of our professional organizations or all of the laws that clinicians need to consider. Um, the take home message is that providers really should do their own research on what their professional okay. organization says now exiting. as well as what their state licensing board says. ASHA, the APTA, AOTA, they all have positions in support of it. Um, and then as far as the law goes, uh, most states require providers to be licensed in the state where the client is located, as well as the state they are located. But this varies by state, and so we just want to encourage all of you to make sure you do your own research. Okay, so I want to take a second and just orient you to what you might be seeing when you start your telepractice session. Obviously, you as the provider um, are going to be sitting wherever you are in your house, uh, whether it's a bedroom or office or um, wherever a quiet place is where you can go and do your sessions. And, and on the other side of the screen, the bigger part of the screen actually when you're joining the session is going to be the family. Uh, right now you're seeing a picture of, uh, of Meadow. You're gonna be seeing a lot of her today. And uh, her mom is about to show me how she's been working on- uh, Unknown participant is now joining. Uh, and. And so just be uh, cognizant that the camera can shift. So right now the camera's on Meadow because that's where m the mom wants my attention, what she wants me to observe. But that might shift back to the mom if we start having a conversation um, about her observations and her reflections on how things are going. So just be aware that this is a snapshot of what you might see, but it could change. 
change. Um, and then and then comes the, the equipment. So what that's what you might see. These are the things you, you're gonna need. Um, both the family and the provider are gonna need a computer, an iPad, an iPhone, Android works as well, or any any tablet. Um, it, all of those different devices, they, they might vary in how they work. So that's gonna be something that you'll be troubleshooting with families, um, but they all should work. Uh, you'll need internet high-speed broadband, a webcam, um, a microphone. Headsets are optional. If you find that you are currently in a noisier uh, environment than you typically are, which many of you might be as you're home with your whole family, um, then you might <laughs> then uh, then you might invest in some headsets, and that might help the background noise. Um, we put eHelper. eHelper is a fancy telepractice word for caregiver. Um, it's it's uh, used a lot when you're using telepractice with older kids to make sure that they have an adult nearby helping. For our purposes, there should always be a caregiver present. Um, so it's not necessarily different than how we would provide face-to-face -face sessions. There should always be a caregiver present and in the telepractice call, they call that an e-helper. Um, and then tele-AAC needs, um, that's just for speech therapists who are working with kids who have um, AAC devices. Uh, there's some extra equipment that you can use to, to um, help facilitate those goals. Again, not something that we'll need needing a lot in our population, but you might be. Awesome. Um, well, how I want to kind of present this um, in in our telepractice field, if, if we've been in the field, um, sometimes we can get a little bit of pushback in terms of um, this model in general. And I'm just double checking. Molly, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Awesome, thank you. Um, so again, we just wanna talk about in general what best practice is. We know that this is a time where regulations are kind of shifting up and down, but it's really important to us that we share the message of what telepractice best practice is. Um, and this is how we were trained, so we're sharing that information um, with you guys during this presentation. Um, so telepractice, the myth number one is that it's not just FaceTime, we're not just um, doing those casual hangouts like we do um, with our family members. Um, uh, telepractice is a HIPAA, FERPA compliant um, element, and it's really important to just to think about those things. Um, there are plenty of platforms out there that are HIPAA compliant, and we are dealing with a, a lot of um, information to be protected. Um, so exploring that and figuring out um, what um, is best for your practice, and especially thinking about that HIPAA compliance piece um, is important. So Microsoft Teams, Zoom Telehealth, WebEx, GoToMeeting, their platform, um, there are many of them out there that um, are, are HIPAA compliant to consider. So the myth number two, um, telepractice makes it hard to maintain attention. Well, the best thing about this and the good news for us is that our main goal is to gain the attention and to help the caregiver gain the child's attention. It's not for us to provide face-to-face, one-on-one, gaining the child's attention to the screen. Um, so that in itself is that coaching model. Um, we're not having the face-to-face -face interactions. Um, it just means that we're adjusting how we're doing our 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 sessions. So we're having to interact with the adult a little bit differently. Um, and even with kids today, kids are often used to that technology in their daily lives. They're using iPads or Kindles, their computer, they're um, FaceTiming or Skyping with grandparents. So they see it often a lot. Um, and, and some kids that will attend to the, the technology may attend at first and then it kind of die off towards the end. Um, so there's different things to think about in terms of maintaining attention, but the biggest thing is that we're trying to get the caregiver's attention, not the child's. Um, the third myth is not everyone is good for a candidate for telepractice, and Molly and I's motto from the get-go has been really let's try it. Um, 
their telepractice and telepractice research has been used with many different outcomes um, related to different diagnoses, developmental delays, including motor delays, um, feeding disorders, sensory processing disorders. Um, some of the recent research that came out was on children with hearing loss and impairment and the um, effectiveness of uh, telepractice with them and their families. There's been much more research on autism spectrum disorder. And I think between Molly and I both, we've been doing this for eight-ish years now um, with a variety of diagnosis and age groups. Um, we have yet to find a child that wasn't appropriate and we've just found ways around um, the different blocks um, in terms of um, what they need, whether it's a, a movement break or a different type of reward. But again, we're working with the family here, so that's going to be the biggest message. Um, so again, when we're, we're kind of thinking about, oh, that kid on my case is so tough. Our motto is still let's try and then you're going to be using that ongoing assessment piece to figure out is this really working all right guys so um we're going to go on to the myth number four some of you might be feeling a little anxious about diving into this world and you might be thinking this is going to be a hassle telepractice is a hassle I am not, I'm not very tech savvy. Well, guess what? You've already seen Brooke and I kind of mess up some <laughs> tech stuff going on right here. And those things are just gonna happen. Um, so it's not as big of a hassle as you might be thinking it is. Um, so I wanna start by just going through some of the possible benefits that you might see, not only to families, but to us as providers too. Um, so possible benefits to families. The child is seen in a natural environment. That's nothing new for us. That's where we see the child every day anyway. Um, but it's just an added bonus that this isn't something that changes with telepractice. Um, telepractice offers uh, this unique opportunity to include other people from different locations, such as family members. Now, I put this as an example, another parent who's at work. Parents aren't going to work these days, um, so uh, those parents might be home, but maybe a grandparent wants to join, or maybe a child is living with his with one parent and another parent is living in another house, and it allows that parent to be able to join the, the session. Um, you can invite interpreters. Um, you can invite other members of your team. So if you have a mentor visit, and um, I could invite a PT to one of my sessions so they, they could observe the session and offer some, um, some advice, some suggestions for me. Um, or you could do a joint visit. So if I have a PT already on the team with me and that family, then we could do a joint session together, just like in, we do in person. Um, telepractice provides a... Uh, Providers are able to participate in more routines, such as eating, bathing, bedtime. Those are often those routines that parents struggle with the most, and they're always telling us about. Bedtime is a struggle. Going to sleep is a struggle. Um, bath time is a struggle. Well, or maybe bath time is one of their favorite activities, and you want to be there for it because you could enrich that experience that they're already um, that they're already loving. So uh, this is. We're, we're not always that flexible, especially up in Northern Virginia where um, traffic is a nightmare after five o'clock. Um, everyone wants to be home before then so they're not stuck in traffic. But this is, is, a, is a way that you could be present some of those routines. Uh, you can record the session and play it back. Um, you're going to meet a family in here uh, today. Uh, Meadow is the child and uh, her mom is Lisa. And I sent the recording of my original training to the mom so she could see it and she emailed back and she was like it was so great to see it this could be another benefit if parents could see their session and remember some of the strategies and get to see it um and so she already is benefiting from being able to see a recording um they, it removes transportation barriers and involves multiple settings and caregivers removes weather cancellations uh, decreases late appointments due to traffic and protects medically fragile children. So, and obviously the, the biggest benefit right now we're seeing is that it's a way to continue services um, during uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, absolutely. absolutely. So I, be I believe. Go ahead, I'm gonna get you a video. I'm just making sure it's shared with our audio. 
so that we have it ready to go. Okay, so yeah, so this next video you're going to see is, um, this is Lisa, and you're going to see a lot of Lisa today and her daughter, Meadow, um, and this is at the end of our session, um, and y'all should know, I called this family two Fridays ago at 8.30. I was supposed to be at their house at 9.30, and I said, what do you think about doing telepractice, and can I record it for a training? <laughs> Um, and this mom was a rock star, jumped right on board. Um, and so this was at the end of the session, and I asked her for her thoughts on how the session went. So that's what you're watching. Thank you for that. Thank okay. you so much, Molly. Thank you so much for doing a telepractice session today. Can I get your thoughts? Just how do you think it went? Do you, did you feel like there were any differences between this and when I'm there in person? Um, or no, I, I I thought it went really well. It's nice to have you here in the living room. And um, <laughs> I know that, you know, um, that this is the most appropriate thing during this time. And so yeah. thank you for doing yeah. it. No, I would say it was really easy. It was super easy for me to log on. Like I expected okay. I'd have to make an account or whatever. And like yeah. I was a little bit just like wondering how much time it would take. It took no time at all. Like yeah. all I had to do was click. So yeah. I, cool. I appreciated the ease of that. Um, it's easy for me, to, obviously, to move you around. I yeah. I have a pretty light laptop, but it's yeah. also nice because you're pretty big here. Like yeah. <laughs> we can really do. Um, yeah. The clarity is pretty good. Um, I would say if, if I could, I could do it on my cell phone too. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the challenging thing I think would be to just like, move you around the house a little bit, you know, yeah. and yeah. Um, make sure that you are getting the right angle that you need in order to evaluate her. Right. But I think the more I do it, um, the more I play around with it, the more I can see which angle I need to put you in and what right. would work best. Right. We did, um, we did a little troubleshooting today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was yeah. able, you know, most of the time I think you saw me out of the corner, but, um, but it's very easy for me to move you and, you know, obviously for you to see her. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. no, I, this is a really great platform and I just want to say thank you to you and on behalf of all your families, I, I know I can't speak for everybody, but I, I'm sure everybody's so grateful that you guys are continuing to try to do this. So yeah. we really, well, really appreciate it. Well, we're hoping, um, we're hoping that this works and that we're do that. All right. So those are just a little thoughts for mom. You're going to see a lot more for later. Um, and yeah, so moving on, obviously you can see that the parents are really um, receptive and appreciative, even if she was hesitant. You know, she, she said in what she said, I was unsure, I didn't know how it was going to work, and, it was, and, and she ended up having a positive experience. And that's why Brooke and I always say, let's try, because their first reaction might be no, and then once they do it, they can see the benefits of, of doing it. Um, Possible benefits to providers. So obviously it decreases drive time and mileage. You don't have to go anywhere. Um, it allows for more remote work. Um, it attracts more providers during times of shortage. If, you're, if your particular locality is having a longer wait list than usual, um, you might be able to get some providers in to, to reduce that wait list for you. Um, provides more variety of more variety of providers. So those low incident needs provide uh, kiddos that um, we want to add nutrition or a teacher for the visually impaired. Um, you know, we have maybe one visual vision therapist in Northern Virginia and she cannot um, go to every part of Northern Virginia to see all the kids that need it. But um, she might be able to add to that caseload if she could do some of them using telepractice. Um, and then this last one is my favorite. It's the one that, you know, the one that um, is for us uh, uh, the most is that increases commitment by all the using the coaching interaction style. You don't have a choice. Um, there's, that, there's no other way to do therapy with a infant or toddler in our program by d except doing the coaching interaction style because you're not there. So, um, Moving on, um, I'm just going to touch a little bit on this. Um, again, I encourage you to do your own research and, and see what kind of research is out there for you. Um, 
but this is the this is a little bit of what we have found so far. Um, so tell, Susan Brogan Johnson of Kent State in 2010 found that telepractice clients make equal progress to traditional methods. Um, in 2011, Jana Kaysen, which I believe is an OT for you OTs out there um, at Spalding University in Louisville, found that telepractice has the potential to enhance early intervention service. Um, in 2000. 12, um, Poisbert found that children with autism made progress on their IEP goals using the telepractice service delivery model um, in 2018. So we're, we're jumping here that we can call more research is coming. Tablet-based home therapy for patients. Um, and then moving on, uh, here's some preliminary evidence and research for autism spectrum disorder specifically. Uh, telehealth results in more active family engagement, um, and then in 2010, uh, I mean 2018, uh, Little found that results in high levels of parent empowerment and self-efficacy, as well as positive child outcomes. Um, so my takeaway from all of this is that research is pointing toward um, supporting uh, Telepractice as a service delivery model and showing that children do make equal progress to um, those kids who are receiving face-to-face -face, uh, sessions. Um, obviously, this is preliminary research. More research is, is needed um, to continue on with that, um, to just pro keep providing more evidence. But enough research is there to support um, providing services in this manner. So we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of the how-to telepractice. Um, and in this part, I'm gonna talk about clinical competencies. Um, you as a clinician, what do you need in your tool belt to help this um, modality work? Um, we are gonna get into a few legal considerations. We feel it's important to bring that out to you guys just so that you are aware. Um, we're gonna talk about understanding what the different responsibilities are for clinicians, parents, and the child. And then we're going to really get into five specific skills to get started. So five things that you can that you can practice to kind of jumpstart you into the into the telepractice world. Um, so moving into the clinical competencies, when Molly and I did our training uh, a while ago, um, the certification process was 37 different competencies that we needed to um, include and demonstrate in order to get that certification. Um, we have just kind of adjusted and Molly has taken those and moved them to the application of early intervention. So what does this mean? Um, for the clinician, it's understanding documentation requirements, which we'll go over a little bit later, um, and not specifically how we're doing our notes, but just some things to include that are um, best practice for telepractice. Um, we're gonna talk about um, clinicians managing that natural environment. So having a competency in managing the natural environment, which we should already do as early intervention providers. Um, Clinician uses appropriate vocal loudness, affect, pacing, and taking that family through the steps of coaching. So that's something to consider is that you are no longer a whole person. Um, you will see a couple different ways you can be viewed. Um, there'll be a PT video um, shortly, and you can see how she's positioning her body. Um, but think about how you look on the camera. So right now I am just a small box and I need to use that entire box um, to my benefit and make sure that I'm not falling too far to the left or out of the view. I need to make sure that my vocal loudness is good so that they can hear me um, and really make sure that I'm using that technology for the benefit of everybody. Um, so clinician demonstrates flexibility in ingesting to the current needs with telepractice. So thinking about all those things that you need to control and be flexible with, this isn't working, let's be flexible and try something different in, in, within this modality. Um, establishing a relationship to help coach the caregivers to provide support for their, chi their child um, in the telepractice settings. So establishing a relationship, we can do that uh, over technology. We want to make sure that that parent is beginning to trust us to help them coach um, their child in, in obtaining those skills. So it's just something to think about where it's, it, you are maintaining that relationship, it's just gonna be in a little bit of a different way, kind of how we're all adjusting according to what's going on right now. Um, 
So having the clinician utilize chat and share screen features in order to support the adult learning style. So that's for the benefit of the caregiver. Um, so there are tools, there are many platforms out there, but a lot of them have these chat um, abilities, these share screen features, and being able to use those to enhance your session um, is a great feature. Sharing a handout at the end. Um, and learning that it might not be wise to share your whole screen because there might be some other things that they might see that might have that HIPAA compliance um, issue, but maybe how just to share the one Word document or the one PowerPoint that you have, and then you can email that to them later um, so that they have it um, for their homework. So it's not you just handing over something. Um, and then utilizing the chat box, if there's any audio problems or if they want to talk to you privately, you know, having that feature there. So really getting to know whatever platform you have and learning all of the ways that you can um, problem solve what you would do face to face. So this is a video of Meadow and her mom and Molly, and this is the first few minutes and how they're setting it up. And I think it's a really good demonstration of things that we will be doing as the clinician as well. So something to think about is that right now you're not just coaching the parent on how to improve a child's skill, but you also have to have the skill of coaching them about the technology as well. So this is a video of Molly uh, going through that process with Meadow and her mom. Molly, do you want me to put you up on some books? Um, let's see, I can, yeah, I can see you really well. Would the books help me see her? Yeah, I think so. Let's okay, see let's, what I can do. The lighting is fine though, because I can see. Okay, you know. okay, okay. Let me um, let me grab some books and see what I can do. Okay, sounds good. Hi, Mado. Hi. I see you. You look so big. You watching, mommy? Where did she go? Well, she was almost, um, well, she's going to be eight months on the table. I can't believe it. I know. Okay, okay wait a minute. Let me get that. Oh, oh. Okay, hang on. No, wait, Where did you go? Let me see. There you are. Okay, right, let's see. Oh, that's great. That's perfect. Well, if, I mean, I can also, let me see. Hang on. Let me see if I can move you a little closer. I, the distance is, it looks good to me. It looks pretty good to you. Yeah, and that way I can see you a little bit too. Oh, is that all right? Okay. Yeah. So we're good? We're awesome. So she takes that opportunity to really Holly, do you want me to put help mom through um, getting that perfect location for the computer? Do we need to sit up on books? Do we need to adjust it? Does the light need to be turned on? Um, kind of going through that whole coaching process, but with technology. Um, so moving on to some legal considerations, just to touch base with these, um, most of the states um, require a licensure in the state. So the the we are main, mostly dealing with Virginia to Virginia. So we are in Virginia, and our client is going to be in Virginia. However, just something to think about: should we be still going through the process of telepractice, and the family wants to go see grandma in North Carolina? Uh, most likely you need to have a licensure in North Carolina. You need to check the state, check what the, um, the code of ethics is. There's charts on all of the, the three different professional websites and it'll go state by state as what the requirements are for telepractice by state. Again, those regulations are very constantly moving these days um, because right now there is very limited success with reciprocity and licensure, but it is something that we wanted to talk about just in case we do have patients that are kind of moving around or want to want to go visit family. It's something good to know. Um, and the tricky thing is that there's just very limited consistency with uh, the state boards and their, their wording on things. Right now for speech, there are 21 states that do have um, actual verbiage on how um, how licensure needs to happen, uh, plus the uh, DC. Uh, Virginia joined that in last September. They were able to come out with their own regulations and firm um, 
guidelines um, about that. In some, some states, some clinicians, if you're pushing into a school, they even need a church teaching certificate. So um, it just gets really tricky. So our biggest take home message for that is um, make sure you know where um, your client is at the time of the session um, and make sure that they are within that licensure so it can really protect that. Um, obviously continue with HIPAA compliance as much as possible um, in, in really firming up on that platform and making sure you know who's in the room and um, shutting the blinds behind you, making sure you're in a nice quiet area, um, all those considerations. Um, and then the last thing is really checking your liability and malpractice insurance um, there just to make sure that they do cover telepractice sessions and that's just for your benefit as well. So all these legal considerations, just good things to think about as you're, as you're jumping into that process of telepractice. Um, so let's move on into the responsibilities of caregivers and EI providers. This statement is, is the ASHA's position, but again, there are statements on the, on the other um, two big provider websites. Um, the use of telepractice does not remove any existing responsibilities in delivering services. That's including adhering to your code of ethics, scope of practice, state and federal laws, and ASHA policy documents on professional practices. So what we're saying is the quality of the services delivered via telepractice must be consistent with the quality of services delivered face-to-face. Um, so that's their position. It's still their position. Um, so we really, when we're moving into this telepractice world, um, really trying to get it right, um, even though it seems like a very big whirlwind. Um, it, in, in general, we really just need to make sure that we're providing the best services all around. So what does that mean for the parent and the caregiver? Um, so on their end, on our family's end, providing uh, either a phone, a tablet, a computer, and having that internet connection with audio video capabilities, um, signing the consent form specific to telepractice, completing a video photo consent form if they want to record the session for any teaming purposes. Um, just like Molly said with Meadows mom, it was really nice for her to have that session and just see it. So they're there is that option available, but a consent form must be signed. Um, I think the biggest takeaway for the parent and caregiver is being present and participating with their child throughout the telepractice session. And most of our families do this already because we're coaching them. Um, but it's also our responsibility to coach them that we are not um, in the home anymore. So even if you had a family where you are working with the child and they say, oh, I've got the baby, can I just go change the diaper? I'll be right back. Um, that's no longer uh, acceptable because you're not there in person. And it really is a safety issue. Think about if you're on this side of the camera and you are alone with a two-year-old on the other side and they walk towards an outlet, there is nothing you can do about it. Um, so it's really important that you coach that parent that even though you're there, like you've been all along, if you've been with them, it's, it's definitely not the same. So they really need to be in the room, um, especially for those safety concerns. Um, and then complying with parent care, complying with all the Part C guidelines, with scheduling and um, service approach and that documentation. And then what is, what is our responsibility as the EI provider? Um, receive training like we're doing today, which is great, and really exploring other avenues of training and learning all you can about the model, um, assuring that parents have completed that consent form and making sure on your end you have everything that you need, um, making sure that your computer and internet connection are running properly to start the telepractice session. It might be tricky if you have more people at home that are using um, other devices that, that take up that bandwidth. Um, finding a quiet space to set up for telepractice with that lighting and few distractions, um, including the background noise. Um, headphones are useful for that if your house is getting noisy, just like Molly said, um, but having the best place for you with that, with that good lighting so that your face is not darkened, um, making sure the blinds are closed so you don't have any background um, visual um, issues. Um, that's important. So logging into that uh, telepractice platform about five minutes early, that's helpful to kind of avoid the, the technical challenges that might come up. If any part of the session is going to be recorded, you really need to notify your parents um, uh, that it, that's going to happen and receiving additional verbal permission prior to initiating that recording. Um, notifying the 
parent, if any session or part of a session is observed by a third party, if you have a student that's involved or if there's another provider that's coming in for a consult, having them be aware that that other person is going to be, be available in there. And then a biggest part is performing that ongoing assessment of the efficacy and suitability of telepractice for each child. Um, having that ongoing assessment will help us figure out if we do need to discontinue the service model, if it's not proving appropriate for the child. Like Molly and I have said, to date, we still haven't found a child that we didn't find the benefit and we couldn't find the improvement in their skills. However, it's important as EI providers for us to keep that in mind um, as part of the process. And then adhering to all standard privacy protections as well. Um, we had some troubleshooting tips in here. I know we've gotten extras from Susan, which was a great kind of overall um, help. These are just uh, basic, you know, if the audio is difficult, check your microphone, your volume settings, the video freezes, which has actually happened to me already, um, kind of waited out. It could be the bandwidth. Um, in problems logging in, you've got passwords sometimes when you, when you create a, um, a link sometimes it will be password protected um, and it varies from different platforms so really that's the part of really understanding your platform and how to help that parent log on um, if there's poor video quality checking the camera lighting is the biggest thing that we've come into and that um, the connection speed as well and then poor view of participants is just adjusting that camera and uh, you'll see with one of my wiggly toddlers soon how we kind of overcame that um, so again, those are just some quick tips. I think my biggest thing is usually whenever I have a problem that I can't solve, I hop off the link and I get back on. Um, and sometimes that just fix it all. So that's my take home uh, little tidbit for today. All right, so we are gonna, um, we are gonna start watching some videos. Um, and these will be um, placed intermittently throughout the rest of the presentation. And um, I want us to, I want you to, as you watch the video, really think to yourself what elements of coaching you're seeing. Um, it might be a joint plan. Uh, it might be that I'm observing a skill. It might be that I'm providing strategies to mom that she's been practicing. Um, so that action practice piece. Um, it might be I'm providing feedback or mom's participating in some reflection questions. Um, or yeah, so just watch the video, see what you see, um, tell me, uh, and you can think about what you think is going well, or you can think about what might I could have done to do different. <laughs> uh, <laughs> better. I'm not, you can critique. You can critique. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we can go ahead and play it, and then at the end, we're going to use that little chat group function to um, to share what we're observing. Great. Um, I saw you. The concern was she wasn't um, taking a bottle. She was preferring to nurse for all of her nutrition, although you had started a few solids, um, purees and right. whatnot. Um, and the plan was you were going to pick one bottle, try it at the same time every day, give her about 10 minutes to, um, to play around with it, and then move to nursing. So right. based on that joint plan, what has been going on? How is that going? Okay, so I did follow the plan. I would say um, I followed the plan with this, um, you know, the nano baby bottle that we had chosen that looks more like a breast. Um, I would say we followed it for about a week and a half, and then what happened was that um, the bottle got left at her dad's house. Okay. So I didn't have the bottle for a couple days, and I was trying to think about, like, what would I do? Um, my older daughter, um, she really liked sippy cups, and I thought, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe she'd like this nipple a little bit better because it's really flat. It's still flexible. Um, mm -hmm. This is a, a vent, I think. Okay. But it's really flat. So I started experimenting with, with sippy cups. Um, I did, let's see, the Como Tomo sippy cup, and then I moved to this one. Okay. Um, we played with it on the floor a lot. She continued mm -hmm. to kind of do what you saw, which was um, a lot of just, she was holding it. She wasn't, like, upset, but, um, but she wasn't really taking in a lot. She was kind of using it more as a toy. Um, 
So after that period of time where she, you know, she was playing with it, but she wasn't taking a lot, I thought, okay, let's try feeding her like, you know, like a regular human being. <laughs> and so um, I started now just giving it to her when we have our solid foods. So she's, yeah, she's up to two to three meals a day, meals, you know. I mean, so typically what I do is like, I'll nurse her um, in the morning and then about an hour and a half later, I give her some solid food. Okay. Um, and then I try to nap her after that. Um, and that works about 50% of the time. Um, and she's learned how to squeal. <laughs> but, like, um, <laughs> but yeah, that works, I would say, about 50% of the time she'll take the solid food and go down for a nap. The other, uh, the other times, I'm, I'm still nursing her to sleep. Um, okay. But I noticed that with the bottle, she was taking a little bit more um, at our feedings. You know, again, she's still, I wouldn't say she's even taking an ounce yet. Although, um, her dad reported that the other night she took about an ounce for him. So, that's, that's good. Um, yeah. And then again, last night when I wasn't here, I was out shopping, um, she, took, she took about an ounce again for him. Okay. Um, so, so, that's some progress, you know. Right. I still very much like her to do it for me because I'm the one that's, that's caring for her 90% of the time, um, right. you know. But, but we're working on it. So I normally, I would just, um, you know, we just start start eating. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. So today we want to, I'm, I saw. All right. So, so take a minute, everyone, um, and open up your chat group if you haven't already. And go ahead and just start typing. What observations did you see? What do you think went well? What did you notice about um whether it looks the same or different than some of your face-to-face -face sessions all right um well thanks everyone for participating we'll have more opportunities um and i want to move forward with this we're now going to get into the kind of the meat of what you have to you know the five must-have skills in telepathy um we're going to talk about learning to follow the caregiver's lead um, we're going to talk about engaging the family, pacing the session to maximize the attention and participation, responding to and managing behavior, and then the last part, um, that, that documentation piece. So skill number one, um, following the caregiver's lead. So um, this, is, this is going to be new for all of us, right? We're not going to be in the home, and all of us have those uh, moments where um, the parent or the caregiver might not be uh, quick to introduce an activity. And so as the therapist, we're quick to introduce an activity. We pick up a nearby toy, we initiate play with the child, um, and then from there we move into maybe a little bit of observation action practice. But we're not there, so that's not something that we can rely on. We're going to have to rely on the parents or the child to choose, um, to choose the activity or to initiate that activity. And one thing though that you can use is your ability to see the room. And if a parent is not quick to initiate something, obviously you saw Meadow's mom, she was ready, that Meadow was in the high chair and ready to go. Um, not every caregiver will be as prepared and ready, especially in the beginning. And so use your ability to see the room and coach parents towards areas of activity that you think might be helpful for that child. So you might see a book laying in a corner. You might see the floor has some cards on it. Um, you might see a blanket on the couch used for peekaboo. Um, PTs and OTs out there, you might um, see that you're in the living room and you can encourage mom to take that couch cushion and put it on the floor like many of you like to do. Um, you might see a sippy cup or a straw cup, um, and you might say, oh, you know, we were talking about uh, transitioning to a cup later today, and I see that cup. Can you show me what that looks like? So um, just because you're not there, you can't initiate play, but you can still use your clinical uh, judgment to coach parents towards activities that you want to, that you would like to see. Go ahead and introduce it. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, at the same, right after I got off the phone with Meadow's mom asking her if we could do a telepractice session that morning, I then called her physical therapist, 
who was also supposed to go to Meadows House that afternoon. Um, and I asked her physical therapist, Ellen Ware, if she would mind um, not only doing her very first telepractice session, but also recording it. Um, so Ellen Ware was a trooper, Meadows family was a trooper. Um, and so what you'll see now is the same family, but later in the day, um, her physical therapist, Ellen Ware, uh, doing her telepractice session. Um, I want you to um, do the same thing. Watch, see what elements of coaching you're seeing. Also seeing how Ellen follows the caregiver's lead and uses what she sees in the room and uses, um, uh, uses the information that she's getting from what, the, what she's seeing in the room to, to guide the session. So. And Molly, this was Ellen's very first telepractice session, correct? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, so, so, so we're actually seeing the very, very, very first one for Ellen. Right. Um, what would you like her to do now? Well, let's see. Marie, now what if you move over to the piano and start playing the piano? Let's see what Maddie does then. <laughs> <laughs> I can see her smiling at you, Marie. Yeah, she definitely likes it. Maybe she should she on the piano? Yeah, let's put her on the piano. Why not? to come over towards you. Mm -hmm. Ask to see if she'll come yeah. towards you. Mm -hmm. He's smiling. She's smiling. She's smiling. So she's kicking her legs a little. Yeah. She looks like she, she needs maybe a little help getting off that left arm. Should I pull it out? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or lean her over to her right a little bit. There we go. Yeah. Look at her pushing up on those arms, too. <laughs> there you go. Come on, good girl. Come on. All right, so go ahead and um, start typing any observations you see, um, things that you think went well, elements of coaching you saw, um, how you saw Ellen use the room and the environment. While people are typing, this is something that I've heard um, Molly express in past trainings, but I love just the snapshot of the family at the very end, because um, if you look at where they are looking, it's not at the computer. It's not at where Ellen is. They're all connected with each other, um, which I think is a really awesome um, snapshot for how this should look. Um, so same thing. There's another video of Meadow and Lisa and myself. For me, because I'm the one that's that's caring for her 90% of the time, um, you know, but but we're working on it. So I normally I would just um, you know we just start start eating. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. So today we want to work on um, your. This is time for a solid meal. So you'll be giving her some trays, and then you want me to look at how she's doing with the sippy cup. Um, yes. Drinking the milk. And is it formula or? Um, it is formula. Um, okay. Honestly, just because I got tired of pumping. Like, That's totally understandable. I have a lot of extra time to do it. I have now a six-year-old. Um, 
yeah, my older daughter had a birthday this week. And so anyway, so I just, yeah, I've been giving her formula. I've wanted her to get used to the taste of formula. And I've also been mixing the formula in with her cereal. Okay. So she's getting it there too. Okay. And that's what her dad is using as well. It is. Okay. It is. Great. I think that's, so what, we had talk, that's little, what we had talked about you doing. that okay? Yeah. So I'm going to give her some food, um, and then I'm, I'll, I'll show you how she takes the sippy cup. Hopefully she'll take okay. a little. Yeah. <laughs> so today we're eating um, bananas and a little bit of bananas and prunes and okay. rice cereal. Okay. I love how she's opening that mouth for that spoon. She seems so ready for it. Good girl. Good girl, yeah. She she does really well with solids. Um, so yeah, I, I wish she would do as well with the bottle, but she really seems to like her um, her solid food. This is probably her favorite meal of the day, just this breakfast kind of time. Okay. Yeah, that looks so delicious, Meadow. I tend to give her maybe, I don't know, depending on how hungry she is, <laughs> like she seems pretty hungry, uh -huh. um, you know, five to ten bites, and then I'll give her some sippy cup. Okay. That's How does she I'm let you know when she's finished eating? Is she able to let you know in some way? I'm doing my best to pick up on her on her cues, right? So I think she um, she turns her head, um, and it, just away from the spoon, and then she also stops opening her mouth so wide, you know. I I see her looking at you and making some sounds that might be, Mom, give me another bite. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And she's, um, she started, like, squealing more, I think, uh -huh. like, when and we're not paying attention to her. She starts squealing and, and making noises and stuff. So I feel like she is letting, letting me know that, you know, hello, she's hungry, right? And, and she wants your attention. Right. So then, um, let's see, hopefully this is still a little bit warm. Go ahead, um, I'm going to ask you, you could maybe um, shift her um, to the side a little bit so that I can see what's going on on the side. Because right now I see, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, like that, perfect. Is that better? Yep, that's better. And let's see, I can also zoom you in a little. Okay. Hi, Meadow. Okay, and so I just gave her the sippy. Um, she does open up for it. And I see some of it spilling. Is that pretty yeah. common? It's a fast flow. Um, okay. It's like one of those, like, it's just cut in the middle. Okay. Um, but she did it not come? take... Did it come cut or did you cut it? Yes, it came that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, so yeah, some of it does spill, but I did hear her take one really good gulp. Nice. Um, here's okay. my older daughter Marie. Hey, honey. What's up? Um, Hi, Marie. Hi, Marie. I did. I told you that. Thank you for telling me. Okay. Can you go down and watch your show till I'm done? I won't be. I won't be long. Okay. Um. So yeah. Maddie. 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 Yeah, what she does gets. She, what does she do if you put it on the tray? Will Will she pick it up? Does she have interest? In, yeah. Marie, honey. You, I, hi, you hi, Marie. I can say hi to Marie. You want to say hi? You want to say hi to Miss Molly? You want to say hi? <laughs> Yeah, so like I told you, she's home from school today for the first time, and so our routine is a little bit different. Of course, that is going on across Fairfax County, I believe. Uh, yeah, um, so what she's doing right now is, oh, she's trying to pick it up. Uh, now, is this something that you've tried before, or? I have, I yeah, I have given it to her before, and so you can see she's trying, she actually is trying to get it in her mouth a little bit. Look at her. Yeah, right? So there's then, some progress there. And you know, part of me thinks, like, maybe I should fill it all the way up to the top so it's easier for her to drink it. I mean, that, that's an idea. I would say that, that if, if that's something you want to try, that is because that way she doesn't have to tip it so much. 
Right, because she um, is like, I don't know if you can see. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, she is actually like, she has it in her mouth. I see it, yeah. And she's she's chomping on it a little bit, I see. Exactly. Let's see if I can hold this and also. Oh, look at that. Hat. <laughs> All right, so again, just jump in and say um, what you observed, what parts of coaching looked um, you know, similar to how they would look in face-to-face -face or different. Um, Carrie says, Molly is using reflective questioning with mom. Mom is doing great with problem solving. Yeah, and Carrie, Sunday, so I've been doing now EI telepractice sessions. Um, I did them all last week, and I did um, one today, and I'm finding that reflect at remembering to ask those reflective questioning is actually a little easier in cell practice because again, you're not there and you're not trying to take over the session or do the feeding for mom or um, initiate some other activity. It really, um, it, it's a way for you to slow down a little bit and figure out other ways to um, do therapy and reflective questioning um, is a great one to remember. Um, <laughs> So skill number two, so all of, we, we had just said skill number one, following the caregiver's lead, and now skill number two, um, we're gonna be talking about engaging the family. So we're already, we've been talking about it, but this is just um, the kind of review. Um, you're engaging the caregiver and any other participating family member in the conversation about the joint plan and their concerns. Now, critiquing myself, I could have taken some tips from Ellen. There are ways that I could have engaged Marie a little bit more. I could have invited her to the table and said, mom, maybe we can give Marie a snack and she could eat with us. Um, I'm going to be learning along with all of you ways to engage um, engage siblings. And, and again, it goes back to that benefit of being able to record. I was able to watch back the session and say, ah, you know, you can do more than just say hi to Marie. You could have engaged with her a little bit more. Um, any activity or routine you practice in person, you can practice on telepractice. Um, I watched, I got to see Ellen's entire session, um, and I didn't, I didn't include this, this clip, but um, uh, Meadow needed a diaper change, and Mom said, oh, we'll be right back. I'm going to take Meadow to, take, to go get a diaper change, and Ellen said, wait, why don't we get Marie to go get a diaper, and then we can do it right here, and I can give you some tips on rolling and putting into sitting and all of that after the diapers change. So they got to do a whole diaper changing routine um, on telepractice as well. And get information about the child's favorite toys, games, books, TV characters. And so you know what their, in if you know what their interests are, you're gonna be able to coach the, that family towards those activities. Remember previous sessions where you can use what you know to help engage the family. Um, and they'll appreciate it. They'll appreciate that you've taken the time to get to know their routines and interests. Um, and they'll see the, the, that there's this ability to engage the family and build a relationship um, even when you're not there in person. So it's all about building a relationship. Like I said, remember the toys and activities from previous sessions and ask the caregivers about them. Um, find a connection with the child and the caregiver. Ask about siblings, previous trips upcoming trips, if there are any, there might not be, um, <laughs> um, and just uh, have that awareness that this is more than just an ex extension of traditional therapy methods, although for us, the coaching part should look pretty similar. Um, so, we've, again, worked, we've talked a lot about this, but here's just the quick list of things to remember if you're thinking, oh my gosh, how do I stay engaged? How do I get the family to stay engaged? Um, use the monitor, the lighting, the body positioning, um, address objects in their environment, um, vary your voice, you can vary the pace, the int intonation, the intensity. Uh, be ready with suggestions about activities if the caregivers get stuck. Um, you might just remember those IFSP goals. If we, if you've been addressing one, you might have those ready, so you can say, you know what, um, we were, we've been working on this, and what about this other goal? How are we doing with that one? 
um, if caregivers are stuck, you as a provider know, like someone said in the comments, addressing other areas of development, remember to ask about those because those are always an appropriate direction to take the family if, if y'all are stuck. Use your caregiver um, and, and the family if they're around. Uh, be prepared. Uh, consider using props to demonstrate what you're verbally explaining to the family. So the biggest one that I can think of is, is baby dolls. PTs and OTs, you can use baby dolls to show mom where to put their hands and how to position the baby. And you're gonna be able to see Ellen use a baby doll in a minute. Um, for the um, developmental therapist and the speech therapist, um, you can have the same toys. I, I think last week I used a toy twice. Um, and only because it was sitting next to me and it was the exact same toy that the child did it, you know, there were those stacking cups and um, it, it engaged the child. I mean, it, let, it had him look at the camera and then he sort of did the same thing with his cups as I did. Um, you don't have to. I, I, didn't, I didn't need to pull those out to engage the child. Um, if you think it would be helpful for the family to see see what it is you're doing with the toy so then they can practice, then um, that would that is an option for you if you have that toy. Um, but I wouldn't think about, oh, I need to have toys in front of me and what if I don't and I don't have any toys in my house. You don't need them. I used them once last week and afterwards I'm sort of reflecting on my own. Did I really need to do that? And I probably didn't. Um, so but baby dolls, you'll see Ellen use one, and I think that was helpful. And um, transition talk, that's just, that's a sort of a telepractice-y word, and it just kind of means you're keeping the conversation going. If mom's carrying the computer and the child into another room, then you're engaging them. You're talking, you're talking to the child, you're talking to mom. It might not be about therapy, but you're just, um, you're just continuing that uh, relationship building conversation. So um, I have a video for you guys. This is um, a, a little wiggly language guy. He's about 25 months uh, old. And um, I have been seeing him for a few months now. Um, and he's a good example of one of those kids who is not going to sit down and just hang out while we do a nice calm session. Um, so during this session with mom, I moved from the floor to the counter while he picked out his snack to the table while he ate his snack and then back to the floor. Mom had me on her computer the whole time. Um, and sister was there trying to steal the show the whole way. Um, and it was super fun to bring her in. Um, like we're all saying where there's going to be a lot more siblings at home. Um, so again, just use that chat box and see any observations that you have, improvements, um, parts of coaching that you see, um, and you'll meet this little guy, Charlie. Oh, His feelings are hurt. <laughs> His feelings are hurt. Well, you know what? That kind of reiterates what we were working on at snack time, too, where we were asking to do something and it was just really hard for him. That's kind of his right. response to it. Yeah. I sit, I sit heavily on him. <laughs> yeah, make it go. Say go. 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 Yeah, it sounded like he was saying, oh, no. whoa. Whoa, good try. That does sound to be tricky. Go. Go. And Abby, that sign. Yeah, there goes your pointing. That sign, I don't know if you can see me do it, but go. Okay. For signing is just kind of like a chop down. Um, okay. And we were talking the last session when I was with you a long time ago about pairing that sound with the action can kind of help him clear, clearly talk about what he wants. So he was saying whoa earlier. Right. But now if he wants to say go, he might do a whoa sound, but pair it with the action, to, and then okay. you'll understand better. Okay. Um, okay. And that might be another thing to teach Miss Henley back there running around. <laughs> um, some signs to help her use for that go. Okay. So typed out any, any thoughts that you might have, um, just as a background, we had just come from the snack table 
Um, and mom had a really awesome reflection that um, Charlie responds much better to Henley, um, his sister prompting him to say words and sounds and to help him out versus her. Um, so that's why we kind of make that, that comment about Henley there. She was, she was on our team as the, um, as the coach. Um, but is there anything else that you guys noticed or saw as far as techniques or um, thoughts, about, thoughts about that? Um, just another point out, I've also heard Molly explain this, and I think it's perfect observation for this video. This is another video of Ellen, and just kind of uh, coming off that, uh, you can only see where, where you are in the box. Ellen chose to be on the floor um, during her session, so I was in my chair and just kind of hanging out, but I thought that was a great point that maybe I want to get on the floor just like them. Um, because you can see a lot more of Ellen's body and especially for those PTs, OTs that are sharing um, a little bit more of movement um, that might be helpful there. Um, so again, this is Ellen and using a baby doll, just like Molly said, I think it was helpful, especially for this mom to see that prop um, for that movement positioning as well. So we'll see what Ellen and um, Meadows mom have going on now. My little baby is kneeling right in between my legs oh. kind of holding her in between my legs and her hands are resting right on my leg. that is a little hard for me physically because of my back okay then forget it but, forget. but hang on but i can do something similar that works that work yeah I, so i've got just one leg bent and one leg straight and is she kneeling right now she is, let me see if I can push you down. Hang on a minute. She's sitting, but she likes that. So can you see how I have my baby? It's like a full on like Catholic kneel <laughs> right here. Oh, okay. No, I can't see the bottom. Okay. Let me see the bottom of your baby. Oh, you've got both legs behind her. Yeah. Let me see. Oh, can we try that battle? Oh, there you go. And then let her rest her hands on your thigh. What do you think? No. Oh, is this okay? Is this good for her? Yeah. Or sometimes if you put a toy right on the other side of your leg, right now she, she's, I think she, is she interested in the computer? She's bring, that, the bring that to the right of your leg. Yeah, right there. Oh. So she's got now one foot behind her and it looks like one foot under her. Is that okay? Yeah. So, well, the goal is, is to get her in this kneeling position because eventually we want her to get to hands and knees. Ah. You know, let's start to think about that kind of thing. Got you. Okay. Yeah, she's tolerating it at least partially. Yeah. Oh, she's got, like you can see here. Oh, she's got one leg curled. Oh, so that's a nice side sit actually right there. We'll take right. Yeah. That's what's going on. Yeah. So if you want to move her back into sitting, just to her regular old sitting position, because you say she likes to hang out like this, right? You're seeing a, a nice diaper butt there. Yes. Mm -hmm. I like it. Good. And then do you want to turn her so she's facing out, uh, facing away from you? There we go. And then to talk about that transition from sitting to her tummy, Oh, right. Take your toy. Take the toy. Yep, and put it out to either whatever side you feel yep. like. Yep. 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 Look at that toy. There you go. Hey, can you get it? So she's gonna need. She might need help with her. Oh, she got it. You got it. Yeah. And so the goal would be to put it a little further so she has to reach further, right? Right. right, right. right let's right. get some peace. But I like to see how comfortable she is just leaning that far. Like she didn't right? think twice about that. Yeah. yeah. She's doing better that way. Okay. Maddie. Maddie. Can you get what about the key? Look at these fun keys. Look at the keys. Uh, uh. So you can put her, you can put your hands on either side of hers so she feels a little more comfortable and 
that left leg, that's the one, the foot the you're... The pivot leg. Yep. Well, you can just put it on the ground. There. There it is. Oh, it's up the I did not want to go get that. <laughs> oh, but now that I'm there, she, I don't know if you thought, but right as you were putting her down towards, she looked the other way. She's like, no, I don't want to do that. Yep. Awesome. So what, and did anybody see anything um, in that video? I saw lots of great things coming out of it. Ellen's doing a fantastic job with her, with her first telepractice session, but does anybody have any extra comments um, with what they saw? All right. Sarah, a really nice example of the importance of making sure we can see and we're being seen. Yep. And it's management on both sides. Um, and the camera. Yeah, I found that if there are any other older siblings or spouse also present, they can manage the camera or on the family's end if they're trying to show something the child is doing and the parent working with the child can focus more intensely on the child. That's a really good thought too. If there's more than one caregiver around, they can help with that camera piece and that visibility piece. That's a great comment. Um, very helpful for that camera management piece. Thank you for that. Um, and then Ellen does a great job with giving specific directions of what mom can do with the child's position. Um, mom did a lot of movement with the camera so that Ellen could see. And again, um, Meadow's mom is very rock star and on top of it, but that's where another piece of our coaching can come in. That's a great, great thought. And um, she was very encouraging to mom's efforts and quickly found ways to re-describe what she wanted as the outcome. There's that flexibility that we are talking about. My words are not quite coming out how I need them to come out. So how can I adjust what I'm saying to make it happen on the other end? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think those are all great thoughts. And Ellen, you know, even though we couldn't see the baby at the bottom, mom and her were kind of talking back and forth, which I think was a, was a great problem solving on both of, for both of them. Um, directions were great. Um, and baby doll definitely did help for hand placement and positioning. Thanks, Jessica. I agree that um, I think that baby doll prop, um, you know, PTs and OGs can kind of play around with it, especially positioning and see how that works for them. Um, Teresa liked how mom knew what position didn't work for her and she came up with an alternative sitting position to try on the floor. Again, that flexibility. And if you think about it, that's probably a situation that would occur in the home as well. This is what I'm looking for. And then the mom reporting back, well, that, that's not going to work for me. So then we have to adjust it. Um, and then Carrie, she connected uh, the purpose of why they were playing and kneeling with the goal of crawling. I loved that. I loved the communication of the end goal. It wasn't just, this is what we're going to do. It was why we're doing it, which was, I think, a beautiful connection that she did make. And I also did notice Meadow's mom was trying to make connections. So the goal is da 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 um, And Ellen went ahead and jumped on it. So that was, that was really awesome. Um, Teresa says, really good connections to goals and further development. Um, absolutely. I think Ellen did a really awesome job with um, that whole management uh, piece of things. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great comments. Hi, little babies. Get back to skill three. Okay. So we are moving on through our skills. Um, and the third one is pacing the session. Um, so I would encourage you to think about it. The family is choosing the activities, but you are the one that's guiding the conversation. You're helping them move through the coaching steps. Um, moving through the coaching steps in a face-to-face -face session sometimes happens naturally with our families. Um, but remember, if you feel stuck, we, we have already learned the outline of what a coaching session should look like. And so um, use that. You, if you get stuck, you know the next step of the coaching model and you can guide that family towards that, that step, whether it's feedback or reflection or observation and action practice. Um, so remember your outline of the coaching model and, and use it, use it to your advantage during these sessions. Um, again, guide the family from the initial joint plan conversation and asking them to choose and demonstrate an activity. Um, 
and then coach them through the strategies, giving them time to practice. A lot of you have already reflected on that in some of your conversations, um, comments in the chat, whether it was a video with me saying, you know, I gave mom the time to talk. I stayed pretty silent and and just let her give me the, the update. Um, or Ellen, in this last video, she really stayed silent and watched. She, 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 there were moments where mom was doing the action and, and Ellen was really giving mom that time to practice before jumping in with her observations and feedback. Um, and then again, guiding them through the reflective conversation. And um, this is, this last note, um, keep an eye on the clock. You will notice that the pacing for telepractice sessions um, feels a little bit different. Um, I know when I first started doing these last week, I would get through 30 minutes and think, oh my gosh, we've already done it all. We've done all the pieces of coaching. Where do we go from here? Things tend to happen quickly. There's not, um, I don't want to, I don't want to use the word downtime, but there's not as much time that's not being used. Um, at, you're fully engaged, the caregiver's fully engaged, and so you might find that you're moving pretty quickly through those, um, through those steps. Um, so just keep an eye on the clock and don't be afraid to come up with, help parents come up with another activity. So it, you might get through something that mom wants to work on in 30 minutes. So be ready with maybe an alternative, looking at those ISSP goals, asking mom if there's anything else she wants you to observe, um, looking at the whole child's development. Um, you know, if I'm a speech therapist, I might ask how PT is going. So there are ways to, um, you know, you don't want to fill time just to fill time, but, but you also are going to feel the pace is different. So it's just something that you're going to get used to. I, I already feel, um, this week's, but today's sessions already felt a little bit more comfortable after doing it last week. Um, but initially it's gonna feel fast. And that's okay, that's just the nature of telepractice. That's a fair observation. Um, I, I think we have, we have another video here with Charlie, again, my wiggly guy, just so you can see um, kind of that movement piece where you're going back and forth and you're not always sitting still with one activity. Um, but just to kind of uh, piggyback off what Molly was saying, um, if you do get a chance to record yourself, it is kind of a different element. Um, I found that um, the first little bit I was talking a lot more because I'm used to being more on camera or, or talking a lot more um, like on FaceTime or something like that. So kind of getting back into that role of EI provider is a little bit, um, a little bit trickier, but it's good to hear from your feedback that it took a little bit and we're all settling down into it. Um, so again, this is Charlie and um, feel free to chat during the video and see anything else that you can kind of take from it. But here's another example from him. Fun option for us. Well, he heard you say Baba because now he's oh. ran, he ran over to get the vacuum again. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> it's what, do favorite. Well, what do you have? What do you have? Your vacuum. Surprise! <laughs> it's a vacuum. His favorite thing. <laughs> That's yeah, right. Yeah. And, and let me show you how you make it go. Oh. He's got his own little I, Dyson. You push this button. I and love that. You said he was possibly getting one for his birthday. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And you yeah. can make it go. I like that word, Henley. You used yeah. go. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think go, it means go, battery. go. For the third time since he's had it. Oh no! You can have great stock and batteries for that one. Yes, yes. Vava, <laughs> yeah, buddy. Vava. So mostly he goes around with Vava and he does that Vava sound. Uh -huh. That's a that's another chance to maybe add in another word since he's doing that one well. Okay. Um, for you to model, just like you're talking about modeling back something different, uh -huh. that would be another great chance. I don't know if you can think of any other word that might be good, that actions that he does with the vacuum or... Um, I don't know, like clean maybe? Clean? 
Yeah. Like on that C word. Yeah. And um, again, that might come out as like keen. It might come out yeah. as like a, um, a smaller version of it. And that's okay. But we were working on that E sound before. So if he's got right. the vacuum and he's doing like ba, 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 you're like, yeah, keen, keen. Yeah. And kind of getting him to do those sounds and seeing how he'll respond to that. Okay. Um, all right, so skill number four, managing that behavior. Um, so I know we've all been in sessions where we've had tantrums and uh, meltdowns, and it's no different in telepractice, unfortunately. It doesn't mean that they're tantruming and melting down because of the modality. You have to think this also happens uh, in person. Um, so we're still supporting the parent to respond to those challenging behaviors. And um, we're still helping caregivers to implement um, session expectations, like if we're using a computer, the kiddo can't just come and bang on the computer um, or play through the phone. Um, and using lots of other strategies that you can think about, redirection, positive reinforcement, um, sensory and movement breaks. So that redirection is what I used with Charlie actually quite a bit, um, where he was doing something. I said, oh, wait, what's over there? Let's see if, and I helped mom guide him back away from flipping on the light switch, which he was kind of fixating on. Um, so all of these management, managing behavior skills can also translate to the telepractice area. Um, but I want to I want to offer a story about this real quick. I've seen a kid now twice. Um, once I saw last week, and once I saw this morning. In the first session, the child cried for 30 minutes because all he wanted to do was grab the phone that his grandmother was holding, and we weren't and we wouldn't let him have it. Um, and during that session, we talked about camera placement and not holding the phone. And um, we, were, we did a lot of reflective uh, reflection on, you know, if grandma wasn't holding the phone, then maybe the child wouldn't be having so many tantrums because then grandma could put all of her attention on the child. And so our joint plan last week was for um, grandma to come up with a place where she could put the phone and not hold it. And the first 30 minutes of our session today were so much better. Um, I love and, that. And so think about your set, your first session might, won't go perfect. <laughs> if it does, great. <laughs> um, but, but some of that joint plan that you're going to be making might be some technology and troubleshooting of, of um, how to manage that child's behavior if, it's, if that technology piece then looks like it's getting in the way. Um, because Mimi, her, I call her Mimi, um, she practiced over the weekend and she found the place. And so we joined the session this morning and she was ready. The phone was up. She wasn't holding it. Um, the kid was placed in his high chair for mealtime and like, and it just went so much better. So if you have a bad session, just think about troubleshooting for the next one. Yeah, absolutely. And we have a thank you for bringing up that piece because um, absolutely toddlers probably are more interested in that technology piece. I will say specifically for Charlie, just in that one session that I did with him, the first five minutes he was there, he was waving, he was trying to tap the computer, and then he was off. So every child is definitely different in how they kind of approach that technology piece, but that's really helpful information for problem solving. Um, so Moving just very briefly to skill number five in that documentation piece. Um, so what to include in the note. We're all going to have the different formats and I'm sure it will come down the line specifics. Um, but I'm talking in regards to what our training was. M Molly and I were trained in how to incorporate this telepractice piece into a note. Um, in the training, they encouraged us to talk about what technology was used. Um, so I think it's helpful even to look back like, oh, that time mom used an iPad and now she's using a computer and seeing, you know, if there's any difference there. Um, so commenting on that piece, um, noting any interruptions, audio or video is, is important. Um, so if you get a freezing, which does happen um, off and on for 30 seconds, just jot that down in your note. There was audio video frozen for 30 seconds. Um, easily came back on. Um, we want to talk about why telepractice is used, and we all know why at this point in time, why it's used. Um, so I'm sure there will be something kind of broadband um, to help us out with that. Um, a, a piece 
we always put in our notes who was present, but the most important part of this is that you can't see necessarily who all is on the other side. So it's important not only to document it, um, but also have an open discussion about it. Um, hey mom, I saw somebody back there. Was that, you know, dad or sibling, you know, just to make sure that we're covering all those pieces with the compliance. Um, all that good stuff. Um, so making sure that that's a discussion, not just um, not just something that you assume and write down. And then where did the session take place um, is also a helpful piece of information as well. Um, and then the rest is just the typical, you got your goals, your ongoing assessment, and your joint plan um, piece. Um, and then I'm sure everybody, just something to note that there are different billing codes, and I'm sure everybody is, is on that who is doing billing, um, but that is a different piece of the puzzle. So we just wanted to start wrapping up things with talking about how to talk to families about telepractice. Um, I think when you say telehealth to families now, their view about telehealth is I'm sitting down and I have the kid on the other side and they're paying attention to me. And I think it's important for us to be able to have those conversations with parents that telehealth with early intervention is not about engaging the child. I mean, we, we have said it till we're blue in the face during the presentation, um, but it's also important when we're talking to families about even trying it, um, that it's not that face-to-face -face screen time. Um, it's coaching the caregiver how to use um, those and promote those skills. Um, we can also tell parents that there is research supporting the efficacy and providing different types of services. Um, and then, of course, we want to use our active listening skills and provide support. There's a lot going on right now. Um, we want to have that nice supportive tone and really listen to them, hear their concerns, but then offer them the information that we know about um, how this, this model could potentially help. Um, I, I want to end with um, Abby and Charlie. Um, Abby um, took some time to give me some of her thoughts about how the session went. And she was really hesitant because Charlie is a very wiggly guy, as you saw in the two videos. He was kind of going all over the place. Um, and she moved the computer all over the place. So I thought it was really helpful to hear from her the feedback um, in how we can talk to parents and what she felt like was a good thing. I'm just kind of curious, like honest opinion on how your end went and how you felt things were in general. I think it went well. I mean, it was surprising to me how helpful it was. Like, you know, right. in my mind, I was thinking, okay, Charlie's not going to sit here in front of a computer and sure. interact with you. But yeah. having you know, taking it around and following us around and you're able to actually see him and give me tips, it is really helpful because, I mean, it, it's a lot like the in-person when you're here. Because, like you said the other day, it was a good point that you're more so giving me the tools, not mm -hmm. so much just you and him. So I thought that was really helpful to hear from a mom's perspective on how things went on that other side after our very first session together. And it, it empowered me to, to keep on keeping on and um, to really help others and, and kind of figure out how to make this work for other families as well. Um, I'm just kind of, we wanted to go ahead and share some of our references that we have um, and just highlighting again where we were originally trained because a lot of this information, especially the background, um, is from that Waldo County General Hospital training that we did back in 2012. Um,